Eight-year-old Maddie Clifton walked out the door and stepped off the face of the earth. At least, that's how it seemed as thousands searched the streets of Jacksonville, Florida for her. But she was there all the time, right across the street, stuffed under their 14-year-old neighbor's waterbed mattress. I'm Chris, this is True Crime Recaps. The last time her mother saw her, Maddie was rounding up more golf balls to hit down the street before dinner. That was around 5 p.m. on Tuesday, November 3rd, 1998, Election Day. Sheila Clifton had just gotten home from voting when her youngest daughter ran out of the house to play. The last thing she said to her was, be back inside for dinner at 6.30. So when Maddie didn't show up at the table and her older sister Jessie couldn't find her anywhere, they dialed those three chilling numbers. 911. In the dark, the Cliftons and their neighbors turned up with flashlights to search the quiet street in Jacksonville. Among them was the boy next door, 14-year-old Josh Phillips. At first glance, Josh seemed to be your average ninth grader. You might even call him unremarkable. A quiet and friendly student with a C-grade average, he had never been in trouble in school or at home. He and his parents, Steve and Melissa, lived right across the street from the Cliftons. It wasn't unusual to see him playing basketball or baseball with Maddie after school and on the weekends. Sure, you might be thinking he was getting a little old to play ball with an eight-year-old girl, and maybe he was, but Maddie thought of him as one of her best friends, and even though they too thought it would be better if someone closer to her own age moved into the neighborhood, Josh had never given her parents any reason to be concerned. Well, no one except his father, Steve, thought anything about it. Steve was a big man with lots of rules, and he was fast with punishment if they were broken. He was especially strict about Josh having friends in the house if he wasn't there. So, when Maddie came over and knocked on the door to see if Josh was up for a game of catch, the 14-year-old ignored her at first. But she kept on knocking, and he had nothing better to do, so he figured why not play a little baseball for a few minutes. They were in his backyard when the ball hit her in the eye, and she started screaming. It was 5.15, and everything went sideways. Seven days later, Melissa Phillips was cleaning her son's room, trying to figure out where the strange smell was coming from. As she picked up his clothes, she noticed some water on the floor near the end of his waterbed. When she pulled the baseboard apart a few inches to check for leaks, she saw something horrible. Something so bizarre, it couldn't possibly be real. A foot was peeking out from under his mattress. For the second time in a week, Jacksonville police responded to a distress call in the neighborhood. This time, they didn't have far to go. They were at the Clifton's house across the street when Melissa came running over and took two officers back to her house. A missing person flyer with Maddie's face smiling up from it sat on Josh's dresser next to air fresheners and incense. When police carefully lifted the waterbed mattress off its frame, they found the girl on the flyer. She was crammed in the teeny space between the mattress supports. Her hand was still clutching the bed frame. Josh had been sleeping on top of her body all this time. In his confession, he claimed he went into a panic when she started to scream after the baseball hit her. He said he just wanted to keep her quiet so his father wouldn't know he had her over. So he dragged her upstairs to his room and hit her over the head with his baseball bat three times to silence her screams. Then he hid the bat behind his dresser and stuffed her under his mattress before cleaning himself up. But when Steve got home, Josh worried he could hear her moaning, so he pulled her out only to stab her repeatedly with his pocket knife before shoving her back under the mattress to die. Maddie dreamed of being a drummer in a band or an eye doctor in a white coat. She never got the chance to find out what she could achieve. But in the short time she was on this earth, she made a big impact. She was already a gifted piano player and was showing signs of being an equally talented basketball player and dancer. Her sister told the Florida Times Union she was always the first to befriend someone who needed a pal. She hated seeing someone lonely or alone. And maybe that's why she empathized so strongly with the quiet boy across the street. Josh and his family had moved to Jacksonville from Pennsylvania almost two years earlier. When her body was found under his mattress, he was in geography class trying to pretend like everything was normal. 
One of the most chilling aspects of this case is just how average the boy next door seemed to be. According to the trial psychologist, he didn't appear to be a sociopath or a thrill killer. He wasn't cruel to animals. He wasn't anxious or depressed. And for the most part, he had a good relationship with his parents. The only thing unusual about him were the small lesions a trial neurologist found on his bilateral frontal lobes, the area of the brain that controls our judgment and how we handle stress. Could that be why he responded in such a horrifying way? Maybe. But it wasn't the only reason, and his story about an innocent baseball game gone wrong may have been nothing but lies. According to the prosecution, 30 minutes before Maddie knocked on his door, Josh was on his computer looking at violent porn. When her body was found, her pants and underwear had been pulled off, and there was no blood in the yard where the ball supposedly knocked her to the ground, bleeding. There was no blood on the ball either, and no dirt was found on her clothes. And that wasn't the only suspicious thing about his story. Maddie's 11-year-old sister, Jessie, remembers Josh talking to them about sex and following her around. And her picture was found in his room. He'd stolen it from her house. But physically, they found no evidence that he sexually assaulted Maddie. However, searches of his computer activity revealed that on the night of the murder, he was back online watching videos of teenage cheerleaders being brutalized even while Maddie's body was wasting away in his bed frame. Eleven days after she walked out her front door to play, she was buried. Hundreds of weeping neighbors lined the streets holding hands and tossing yellow flowers onto the street for the funeral procession, making its way to the cemetery. And not long before this horrific murder, Florida changed its laws so teenage killers like Josh could be prosecuted as adults and convictions for first-degree murder came with an automatic life sentence. His lawyer pushed for manslaughter or second-degree murder, but didn't put his defendant on the stand to explain himself. In fact, he didn't call any witnesses at all, and the trial was over in two days. It took a jury less than two hours to agree on a first-degree murder charge and put him away for life. Since Josh was convicted, laws have changed again, and life behind bars is no longer mandatory for some juvenile offenders. In 2017, he was back in front of a judge almost 20 years after killing Maddie. He was hoping to get a second chance at freedom, but once again, the courts upheld his original conviction, life in prison. Some crimes are too heinous to be forgotten, no matter how old the perpetrator. In the eyes of the law, this is one of those. According to the medical examiner, Maddie was still alive after he stabbed her and shoved her into his bed frame for a second time. Yet, Josh slept on top of her body for six nights without saying a word. In hindsight, his mother noticed he seemed quieter than usual that week. But other than that, his behavior at home and at school was completely normal. And even as he sat on trial for his crime at age 14, he showed almost no emotion. But Maddie's wasn't the only life he ruined. A year after he was locked up, Steve, the father he was so afraid of, was killed in a one-car rollover near the prison. Across the street from his childhood home, grief pushed Maddie's parents apart, and a few years after her daughter's murder, her mother left her husband and surviving daughter alone in the Clifton family home and moved away. They divorced a few years later, but today, Jesse still lives in her childhood home. She bought it from her father in 2017 to keep her sister's memories alive. As for Josh, in the years after he took her life and ruined his own, he went on to get his high school diploma and clerk in the prison law library. He also teaches GED science and math to other inmates, according to the Times Union. In 2003, he'll get another chance to make a case for his freedom in front of a judge. And do you think he should get out, or is he exactly where he belongs? Let us know in the comments, and if you like getting all the crime in half the time, it would mean so much to us if you took a second to give this a like and hit subscribe and the bell so you never miss a recap. My wife Amy and I are here three times a week with new recaps. Until next time, take care.